I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter number 15. And while you're turning to Luke chapter number 15, uh, I want to read the opening verse that we've been giving every Sunday. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 15. You should probably have it memorized by now. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So now we're going into Luke chapter 15, and I want to read the end of the parable. We've read this parable the last two Sundays. We read the first half of it. When we got up to verse 24, we stopped. But now I want to read verses 24. Ask the Holy Spirit to give us understanding about overcoming the orphan spirit. How many are connecting with me? I'm not going to preach long today. I really don't plan to preach long. I only have three real important truths that I want to bring to you. I want to illustrate those quickly with you. I want to pray over you and I want to release you. Haven't we had a wonderful day today? Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise. I tell you what, the Holy Spirit has just orchestrated this service from beginning to end. The prayer time, the moving of the Holy Spirit, the praise and the worship. I I just want to put a capstone on it. If you'll give me your very best ear for the next little while, I promise you I'll speak quickly and I'll try to communicate effectively and we'll get a word today to sink our teeth into how that we can overcome the spirit of an orphan mentality by the spirit of adoption through the Holy Spirit whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So we're asking the Holy Spirit to bring us revelation about this parable. And the parable of the prodigal son has two sections the first one deals with the younger son, which was the prodigal, rebellious son. The second section refers to the older son, which was the religious prodigal son. And it says in verse 25, now his older son, the man had two sons, the younger and the older, and the older was in the field. And as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things mean. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But and this is the older brother it's talking about here. He was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he wasn't even his brother, he's just his father's other son. When this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. But the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is mine and it's also yours and it was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and he is alive he was lost and now he is found you can be seated this morning I want to just speak to you just for a few minutes about this older brother there was a prodigal son we call him the rebellious one. He had this spirit of an orphan spirit that released inside of him and it really inspired or it manifested him in a rebellious manner and he went away from home and he squandered his living, of course, in his inheritance and he came back home and he repented and the father welcomed him back in the house. But the scripture here also tells us not only was there a rebellious son, but there was a second son. Now the first son, the orphan spirit, and I'm summarizing some things. If you're downloading the notes on the YouVersion Bible app, you'll see there's a lot more material there that you can review. And I want to remind you, of course, in, in fact, if this is your first time with us in this series, that when we talk about an orphan spirit, we're not necessarily talking about something austere or, or something that's dramatic, something that's like very uh, 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 sensational. What we're talking about is an 
influence that causes people to feel rejected, separated, and abandoned, particularly from any father influence or authority figure in their life. And that's so important because a healthy, vital relationship with a father is one of the single most important things a person can have in their life. Now that's true on a natural level, but how much more is it true on the spiritual level? You see, your relationship with your father in heaven is like a thermostat that levels the measure of the spiritual heat or life in your body. Just as a Thermo thermometer would measure temperature, a thermostat sets temperature, your relationship factor it is what sets the temperature of your spiritual life with God because so many things flow into your life from a good relationship with your father you'll remember some of these things we've taught about them your identity flows from your relationship with your father your inheritance flows as a direct response from the life of the father your security your affirmation your intimacy your worship one of the things that the Holy Spirit is doing is raising up the world worship here at Family First, and that's because we're coming under the revelation that we are sons and daughters of the Father. A lot of people can't worship the Father because they don't know they're a son or a daughter of the Father. But once you grasp the fact that you are a son or a daughter of the good, good Father, then worship naturally flows out of that relationship. And, and here's a powerful little thought for you, and I treasure this idea because uh, sonship, being sons and daughters of God, it really is the new container. I'll use a Bible word for you. It is a new paradigm. It is the new wineskin of ministry in the kingdom of God. How many know what I mean by that? It's a new wineskin. Jesus told the story in Matthew chapter 9 that you don't take new wine and put it in an old wineskin. If you've got new wine, you have to put it in a new wineskin because if you put it in an old wineskin, it's going to burst. The uh, I could give it to you on a scientific scientific level, but the process of that wine breaking down, the fermenting process, if the skin is already hardened and dry because it's an old wine skin, it will not stretch. And when the fermentation begins to take place, the wine skin will burst. But you take new wine and you put it into a new wine skin so that when the process of development takes place, the wine skin will stretch and it'll change. Is anybody listening this morning? It will be able to flow. It will be able to adapt. Adapt. It will be able to receive the new wine that the person is putting in the new wine skin. And sonship is the paradigm that we've got to get in our framework, in our thinking about life in the kingdom of God. We've got to get delivered and I'm starting to get into my message now. I'm starting to throw out all my promises of a short sermon. Come on somebody. <laughs> we, we have got to get delivered from a religious mindset. We've got to get delivered from an intellectual mindset. We've got Got to get delivered from a mechanical or a ritualistic mindset and realize that sonship is the new wineskin and what God wants to do in our lives is a flow of his spirit of adoption that is in us because we're sons and daughters of God. So when we went to the parable of the prodigal son a couple of weeks ago, we identified 10 destructive characteristics of the orphan spirit. There were seven characteristics that we identified from the rebellious son, the first son, and that was last time. Today there are three characteristics that we're going to identify from the second son, which is the older brother, which is the religious son. And I want you to know before I get started, and it's not going to take me too long to, to really bring this to you. The first son was rebellious. And he had the orphan spirit manifest in his life in that regard. But the second son is a perfect picture of a religious spirit, a religious thinking mentality that represents an indication or a manifestation of an orphan spirit. You see, his life is a picture of how this orphan spirit, you're connecting with what I mean by an orphan spirit by now. It's the idea that nobody cares for me, that nobody loves me, that nobody's there for me. I'm all by myself. I'm cast out. I'm rejected. I'm abandoned. Nobody knows 
knows what I'm going through. I've just got this poor pitiful me mentality. If that will not get you to rebel because you're rebellious, then it will also, if you're religious, it will try to get you to sink in that to the religious cocoon. And if you take this orphan mentality and it manifests into a religious spirit, then you've got a framework on your hands that this spirit can really operate in a person's life. And get this, a religious spirit. How many know what I mean by a religious spirit? Let me just define this for you. A religious spirit is an influence which rises primarily out of pride and it focuses on rules and regulations rather than on a relationship with the Father. And if you've got a religious spirit, and if it will manifest in cohesion with the orphan spirit, you've got one of the most destructive forces that will ever operate in a person's life. I'm going to hurry just as quickly as I can, but here's what a religious spirit does. A religious spirit substitutes rules for relationship. It substitutes busyness for fruitfulness. It substitutes activities for intimacy. It substitutes attendance for real engagement. It substitutes mere words for worship. And if you don't get the idea quite yet, God put an anointing on me about 20 years ago and I have the ability to agitate religious spirits. I treasure this anointing. I thank God for it every day. And I think if there's anybody in this room this morning that's got a religious spirit, you're going to start getting agitated and just rest assured that's confirmation of the anointing that's on my life because I love to agitate. I love to make religious spirits angry come on somebody i do i love to get in their face and just stir them up and say i don't care how many years you've been saved what are you doing for jesus now i don't care how many languages you speak in i want to know the lifestyle of the fruit of the holy spirit what the fruitfulness. You see, religion substitutes rules for relationships. It substitutes words for worship. It substitutes activities for intimacy. It, it substitutes attendance for mere engagement. But Pastor Coach, I haven't missed church in 49 years. Good. I notice you sleeping about 48 of those. <laughs> you, know, you know, what's the difference? You know, you might as well stay home in your easy chair. But religion says, but I was there. You know how to tell a person, this is, this is the anointing that comes off me when I start talking about a religious spirit. You know how a person that's really religious, you know how you can see it? Because they make the ugliest face you've ever seen possible. I mean, when, when, they, when they worship, it's like, does it really hurt that bad? You know, sister, are you really in that much pain? And I got to hurry, got to teach a little bit here and give you some material. But this older brother had the characteristics of religious spirit. Now, let me let me give you these three things, only three real quick. The orphan spirit causes sons and daughters to get caught up in offense. Religious spirits. Manifested this orphan mentality will cause sons and daughters to get caught up in offense. How many know what I mean by offense? Offense, I'm not talking about, you know, a, a picket fence or a chain link fence. I'm talking about offense, O-F-F-E-N-S-E. -E. Getting your feelings hurt. Feeling like someone has mistreated us. Getting the notion that we've been left out, overlooked, forgotten, or bypassed. Thinking that someone has intentionally did something that hurt us and on and on and on. I'm going to make a statement here. If I haven't agitated the fire out of the religious spirits in the room quite yet, then this one is probably going to do it. Religious people can often be the most touchy people on the planet. I was thinking about this the other day. Religious people get their feelings hurt so easy. More so than, than worldly people. Religious people are always, it seems, wearing their emotions on their shirt sleeves. They're always taking offense to something, always getting offended, always getting their feelings hurt. And don't, don't, 
just just stay with me on this for a moment. Worldly people don't get offended nearly as quick as Christian people. You say something harsh or someone wounds or offends a, a, a non-church going person and a non-Christian person, they're not going to walk around and worry about it for the next 30 days. They're just going to blow it off and say, well, that's what you think. That's your opinion. You've got a right to be ignorant. And they'll just, they'll just go on and not think another thought of it. But uh, how many times do Christian people say things like, I wonder what so-and-so meant by that. I wonder what motivated them to, and we second guess and we, we, we read into everything and we overly spiritualize everything. Can, can I give someone a freedom today to just be real? You don't have to overly spiritualize everything that happens in your life. Here's a tweet for you. I put this out last week. Not everything that happens in life is a sign from God. Not everything that shows up in your Twitter feed or on your Facebook page was a sign from God. Some of it is a sign that you've got stupid friends that are giving you wrong information and you need to get away from them because it's the law of association and they're leading you down the wrong path. You know, but pe- oh, it's a sign from God. I saw this the other day. And oh, it was a sign from God. No, it wasn't a sign from God. It was just there. It, it just happened. But religious people, you know, we're always getting our feelings hurt. Always getting offended. I, I, somebody said, Pastor, where's the, where's the Bible on this? I'll give it to you. Look, look here at uh, verse number 25, Luke 15. The older son was in the field. And when he came and he drew near to the house, he heard music and he dan- dancing. And he called one of the servants and he asked what these things mean. Now, it goes on to say in verses 27 and 8, that when he asked, the response was, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. And the older brother, the Bible says, was angry and he refused to go in. Now here was a spirit that's offended, that's wounded. He is so religious, he doesn't even know that a party's going on. I mean, it was pretty obvious there was a party going on. We've killed the fattened calf. There's music, there's dancing, there's celebration, there's happiness, there's joy, there's festivities. And here is his response. What in the world is going on at dad's house? Because he didn't have a clue. Let me give you a little uh, indication of something here this morning. There's a party busting out all over America today because prodigals are coming home. People are getting right with God. The church is coming alive into worship in the Father, in spirit and in truth. He's raising up young men and young women into ministry. He's re- releasing the arts, things like music and dance and graphic arts and painting and creativity and poetry and many other things that God is using in this hour to raise a literal party in the house of God. And here is the response of a lot of religious people in the church what in the world is going on at church nowadays what in the world is that music they're singing now at church what in the world is all that stuff let me tell you what it is it's a party man because God is celebrating that the prodigals have come home and there's music and then dancing and they're celebrating the brother was so blinded to it all that the orphan spirit was manifesting this spirit of religion on him and he didn't even know what was going on so he said to him your brother has come home your father's killed the fattened calf and he was so angry He refused to go in. Now, Dr. Luke is quite eloquent there when he says that the older brother was angry. Let me give it to you in the the real sense. He was ticked off. (laughs) He, He was incensed. In fact, I think this is the most tragic part of the story. And I'll develop this a little bit more in the days that are to come. He was so angry, he refused to go in to the house. He said, I don't care that my brother has come home. I don't care that God, that dad is throwing a party. I don't care that everyone is celebrating. I don't care what is going on. I am not going in there. And the scripture says that the father 
Isn't he a merciful father? Isn't he a wonderful, drawing, welcoming? He went out to entreat him and debate. And if you read the end of the parable, there's no indication that the older brother ever came in the house. He might have stayed outside. He may have missed the whole party. He may have chose to sit in his own, in his own uh, sorrows and miss the celebration that was going on in the father's house because he refused to go in. Don't miss the obvious here. I believe when the prodigals start coming home, how many are praying for the prodigals to come home? Can I see your hand? When God starts bringing people, they may not dress like me or you. They might not even talk like me or you. They might come in smelling a little bit different than you or me. And it's not because they've dusted themselves with Chanel number no. five. It's because they dropped something out on the seat as uh, on the outside as they were. And they, they may not smell like they've been exactly where we have been. But let's don't be so arrogant and proudful that we said on the outside steps instead of coming in and rejoicing with the people that God is going to bring into the house and that religious spirit will drive people away from what God wants to do. Here, here's what I think. I think the older brother wanted to see the little brother crawl like a, like crawl in the grass and beg like a dog to get back in the house. I literally, I think he wanted to see him humiliated. Now get this. I think he wanted the father to make him perform because a religious mentality says you don't have favor unless you earn it, unless you perform for it. So the only reason that God loves them is because what they do for God. Their mindset is performance. But do you remember a few weeks back we talked about the performance-oriented father? And the performance-oriented father raises up sons and daughters that never feel like they have the father's affirmation. I want to tell you the father in heaven is not a performance-oriented dad. He's a dad that says, my mercy and my love will accept you and welcome you and forgive you. But the religious spirit creates a performance-oriented mentality. And the older brother, in his offense, said, I just don't think little brother deserves to come into the father's house because he hasn't earned that place at the table like I have. You know what here I believe? Here's the real clincher about this religious spirit thing. The high and lofty rules that they have made up in their minds apply to everyone except themselves. When they sin, they expect the Father to forgive them. When they make stupid mistakes, they expect the Father to overlook them. When they act out of selfishness and pride, they expect the Father to give them another chance. But it's always the poor old little brother. It's always someone different level of expectation and the scripture goes on to tell us that the older brother in his spirit of religion was caught up in his offense and had his feelings hurt to the point he didn't even come in to the celebration now here's another one and i'm going to keep you alone today i want to give you these two things real quick and this is actually i think in our numbering this is number nine and ten because we did seven uh, last week. Number nine is this. And if you'll receive this, oh, it's so huge. The orphan spirit seeks to cause the sons and the daughters to get caught up in comparison. Comparison. His father came out and entreated him. The father said, come on in, son. But he said to his father, look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. You have never given me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, when he comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Comparison. Comparing ourselves among ourselves. The Bible says we are not wise. I've preached many times about the tyranny of comparison. And I'm not going to linger on that today, but let it suffice to say that if you get caught up in the tyranny of comparison, that is a terrible, terrible way to live. Comparison will drain every bit of joy 
out of you. Comparison will cause you to filter in the blessings that God has given you in comparison to some blessings that God has given to somebody else. I've preached in the past about the disciples. When they were looking at how they were going to live their lives, Jesus predicted that some of them were going to be martyred and some of them were going to die. And they looked at each other and they said, well, well, what about John? Or what about Peter? Or what about James? And the Lord said, what is that to you? In other words, Words, stop comparing yourselves among yourselves. If my plan for someone is to experience this and my plan for someone else is to experience something else, then what does it matter? Do not compare yourselves among yourselves because when we get caught up in that spirit of comparison, it literally drains the joy and life right out of our living for Christ. And here's the humorous thing, and that's probably a, a poor choice of words, but it's, it's funny in a really sad sort of way. It's really funny in a sad sort of way about this story. When the prodigal came home, what did the father do? He killed what? The fattened calf. What are we talking about there? <laughs> We're talking about uh, steaks. We're talking about barbecue, baby back ribs. We're, we're talking about incredible, incredible things. He killed the fattened calf. And the older brother in this confusion of comparison, notice what he says. He says, well, father, you never even gave me a goat. You ever see that? Why? Why? He, he, the father killed the fattened calf. And the older brother says, well, you never even gave me a goat. I think he's so incensed, he's so worked up in his comparison that he's not even living in reality. He doesn't know the difference between a, between a cow and a goat. He doesn't know the difference between a, a calf and a, and a goat because he's so caught up in his comparison that he loses the mentality that the father wanted to give him whatever it was that he needed. And I want to tell you what, religion can get people so messed up they can't even see what blessings are right in front of them because they're caught up in the comparison. Now, I, I realize he may have intentionally changed the word to draw the contrast. He may have intentionally trying to drive the comparison that you gave the brother a cow, but you never even gave me a goat. He may have been intentionally trying to draw that comparison. I, I understand that. But what he was saying is that just really gets my goat. <laughs> that just really ticks me. Oh, that must be the place where we came up with this figure of speech. You ever hear anybody say that gets my goat? <laughs> this must be where that figure of speech came from. The, the older brother must have said to the father, well, little brother got my goat. That, that just really gets my goat. That just really ticks me off. But he was just so messed up in his confusion because of this orphan spirit that this tyranny of comparison had just done its work on him. And here's the last one, and I've given you this before, but I just want to Massage it in a little bit. Look at verses 31 and 32. The orphan spirit will cause sons and daughters to think and to act like that you're a son or a daughter of God. Can I give you this? I, I passed over it earlier. But get this. I said this last week and then I reworked it so that it would be more eloquent for you to receive. God, but now I am a son of the Father. Did you know you're a son? Or you're a daughter of God. You say, oh, Pastor, I, I, I've told you this before. You remember? People say, oh, I want to be a servant. I want to have the heart of a servant. I want to have the heart of a servant. That's good. We all need the heart of a servant. But we don't need the mind of a servant. Because servants can't think like kings. Servants can't think like sons and daughters. Servants think like servants. We need to have the heart of a servant, but we need to have the mind of a son because there's royalty inside of us. Oh, come on, somebody. God has given us assignment. He has given us jurisdictional authority. That's why when the Bible says that Jesus is the King of Kings, we read into that verse, if He's the King of Kings, then who are the other kings that He is the King over? Guess what? I am. And God has put me and He's put you in ruling, reigning, jurisdictional authority over the region 
region that God has placed us in. God has given me. You say, Pastor Coach, you're crazy. That's okay. You don't have to rehabilitate me. I'm happy just like I am. God has given me. I believe this. If I'm in the ministry and if I don't believe this, I need to quit tomorrow. But I believe this with all my heart. When God called me to Hernando County, He gave me jurisdictional authority. And I've got power and authority over all the principalities of darkness that serve in all of Hernando County. And I can speak a word of deliverance. And I can deliver people and minister to people. And I'm the pastor of this county. I don't know if you know that. And the other pastors, they probably don't understand that yet either. But maybe God will give them revelation on that someday. There are a lot of people in my church that I haven't even met yet. I'm their pastor. And someday they're going to walk into this building and they're going to say, oh, it seems like I've known you for 20 years. Yeah, that's because I've been praying and I've been covering the spiritual atmosphere over this city for the last 20 years so that you could walk in and get freedom and get deliverance and you could be lifted up out of yourselves into the promises of God because I've got jurisdictional authority over this area. Some of you need to get jurisdictional authority over your house. Go on, I'm going to preach pretty good right now. Some of you need to get jurisdictional authority over your own mind. You need to get jurisdictional authority over your body. Well, oh, Pastor Coach, I just couldn't help myself. Yeah, you could. You made a decision to do what you did. It wasn't that the devil made you do it. It was because you made a decisions, and decisions decide what happens. Are you still here? But i got to close, close with this. Verses... Thirty-one and thirty-two. The older brother said, "Son, remember he's all worked up. He's all angry. He's all just offended, and he didn't get what he thought he deserved." And he said to him, "Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours." It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother of yours was dead. And is alive. He was lost. And he is found. Maintain the mindset of a son. Because an orphan spirit will try to get you to think and act like a servant. When you're not a servant, you're a son. A servant said, well, if you loved me, you could have given me a goat. You could have given me a calf so that when I went to have a party with my friends, we could have had something to eat. And oh, if, if you would have treated me like you treat your other servants. You see how that had changed his whole identity. He was living into a vision of servanthood, not living into a manifestation of sonship. And the father said, oh, son, don't you realize everything I have? It is already yours. If you wanted a cow, you could have taken one. You own it all. You're a joint. I wouldn't have held back. I wouldn't have withdrawn it. I would have blessed it. And I would have honored you. And sometimes we're living into a servant mentality. Rather than to a sonship. And realize that the Father has given us everything. But we've got this mentality of servants that we've got to deserve it or we've got to earn it or we've got to somehow perform to receive it. And the Father says, oh, son or daughter, don't you realize it's already yours? I know I've illustrated this many times. I think it's a wonderful illustration. So just bear with me a moment. The difference between a mind and a heart is illustrated by, if you go to Walmart, I've used this before, you'll remember this. And you're looking for something. And you're walking up and down the aisles and you'll meet a nice gentleman there. And he has a badge and it says, my name is such and so uh, Jones. I'm an employee of Walmart. I'm a servant of the corporation. And you say, well, sir, where, where is this item? And he'll say, oh, that's over there. 
Now, Walmart used to be a little bit better than this. They used to say, it's not over there, but they used to say, let me show you where it's at. And they would take you. I was in a place of business the other day, and a young man did that for me. He didn't take me by the hand. Let me just, let me rephrase that. <laughs> but he led me. He said, oh, it's down this way. And he, he walked down to the aisle and showed me where it was. Now, I was in another place of business, and sometimes I, it's good for the Holy Spirit that I have selective memory. My wife will have to remind me wherever it was now not right now but you'll have to remind me we were in a place of business yesterday and I forget exactly where it was I think the Holy Spirit is having mercy on that place of business right now by not allowing me to remember who where it was but oh there you go it's over there hope you find it there you go well no a servant is going to say I hope you find it and they'll walk over to that aisle and lead it you to it but a son's mentality is if you find someone walking in the Walmart store and they have a badge on that says, my name is such and so. A servant of the Walmart corporation. I am an inheritor of the Walmart fortune because I'm not a servant. I'm a son. They're not just going to say, oh, it's over there somewhere. They're not just going to point you in the right direction. They're going to say, let me walk over there and help you find it. And I know that it's break time right now. And I, I, I'm, I'm short on, on getting to my coffee break. But sons will do more accidentally than what servants will do on purpose. That's a huge statement. Listen to that. Sons and daughters of God will do more for the Lord accidentally than what servants will do on purpose. Servants say, oh, I come to church every Sunday. Servants say, I pay my tithe. Servants say, well, they asked me to do that Royal Ranger thing one time and I tried it and it, oh, well, I was a servant for that. <laughs> I'm just picking on the Royal Rangers. I could, I could pick on the Impact Girls Clubs and everybody else. But a servant will do some things for God because he feels obligated. But a son will do more accidentally than a servant will do on purpose because he's got the DNA of the house that's inside of him. And he's a son or he's a daughter of the father. And I just love that. Son, anything you want, it's already yours. All you have to do is receive it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to perform to be good enough to get it just ask what you will and it shall be done and i think that we need to be released sometimes in the in the family to just realize whatever the father knows that we have need of if we'll just receive it it's ours i want you to stand with me this morning i want to pray over you and i'm going to release you to go here in just a moment but I want to say, first of all, if there's anyone in the house today that does not have in your life the reality of a personal relationship with Jesus, you need to know that as a prodigal, you can come home. The Father will not humiliate you. He will not uh, speak to you in a condescending manner. In fact, the scripture says he'll run to you. He'll put those four things on your life that in a, indicate identity and anointing and covering and all those things we've talked about before. And He'll forgive and forget every sin you've ever committed. But I also want you to know today, if there's any twinge of a religious spirit that wants to rise up inside of you from time to time, please, please, don't get angry at your pastor today, but receive it with the uh, passion of which I'm trying to speak it. Realize that that is a manifestation of an orphan spirit mentality, an abandonment, a rejection, an overlooked and offended, a bypassed mentality. And that religious spirit that tries to manifest inside of us will lead us away from a relationship with the good, good Father into mere life of relationship.
that is devoid of any life-giving strength and power. So recognize it and say, Oh, Father, I want to come back to the newness. I want to come back to the freshness. I want to come back to the, the tenderness of a relationship and know that I don't have to earn anything, but you give me everything. I don't deserve anything, but you provide everything that I need. Lift your hands with me all across the room. Would you do that? Father God, today, I just praise you and thank you for a wonderful time today here to connect with our family, spend time with you, and pray over our nation, and sense the presence of your Holy Spirit encouraging us in this room. And I pray that, Lord, any... Not only just re rebellious spirits, but any religious spirits that would try to attach itself to anybody. That we would recognize that thing and we'd cut it off. And realize by the spirit of adoption, we can cry, Abba, Father. Personal relationship with Him. So, Father, I just pray you bless the people. Lord, give us a great week this week let us be productive help us lord to share with everybody that we can about the special events next sunday to fill this place up with new people pass out all the cards and the flyers that we possibly can go so take all pass them out the service next week will be a little bit different, of course. We'll not preach on this subject. We'll be preaching a very simple uh, message of relationship with Jesus Christ. The Lord willing, we may tailor things a little differently. We may streamline it a little bit. But if you'll invite people, 80, 80, I, I saw a statistic. I think it's 82%, 82% of people will come if you give them a personal invitation to come with you on church. So take the postcards work.